Hi, this is um, notes that are just going to be um, kind of an introduction to chemical equilibrium. So um, chemical reactions, not all, but a lot of them can be reversible, which means that you can, if you look at this example um, in the animation that's going with it, um, the nitrogen and the hydrogen can combine and form the ammonia, NH3, but then look at, so there's your NH3. Now it can also then break apart and form, reform the reactants. Um, there's also, there's something called chemical equilibrium. When you do have a reversible reaction is when um, the rate of the forward and the reverse reaction are equal. So after some time has passed, if a reaction is reversible, it will um, reach chemical equilibrium. And this doesn't mean you have equal amounts, it's just of the reactant and the product. You can see that in my little analogy here, that there's not equal amounts of what the ants are carrying. Um, the two piles are different, but yet the rate that they each drop off um, one little piece, those are happening at the same rate. So um, I'm going to pull up my iPad so I can write. So chemical equilibrium, if you look at it graphically, one, you can do the rate. So assuming that you only have the, you know, the forward reaction, let's say is A plus B, and you haven't made any of the C and the D in the very beginning. So they would have, you know, the rate's going to be very low because you won't have formed much. Whereas the forward reaction is going to slow, the reverse reaction is going to speed up until they start to happen at the equal rate. You can also look at this in terms of concentration. So in the beginning, assuming you start with just A and B, there is no product, but as time progresses and it turns into the product, then the products are going to also increase. At equilibrium, the concentration, the amount of the reactants in the products is going to be constant. Sometimes, um, just so you know, we use um, double arrows to show that a reaction is reversible, um, and we can do those in a lot of different ways. So dynamic chemical equilibrium, this is um, what we are talking about, where um, it's not like everything just stops. It just means that the rate of the forward and the rate of the reverse are equal. So some examples are like vapor pressure. In the beginning, when you pour like water into a closed container, there isn't really any vapor, but eventually there is some vapor that gets formed, and that vapor then can easily you can see some of the molecules are going into the gas form and some are coming back. And over time, once they get to equilibrium, those um, the rate of becoming a gas and, and then the rate of the gas becoming a liquid will equal. So um, they're, they're continually evaporating and condensing, but <clears throat> they do it at an equal rate. Solubility is another thing that has a dynamic equilibrium. So once you um, form like a saturated solution, the amount of the, <clears throat> the solute that goes into the solution equals the amount of the solute that comes out or, or is not going to be able to be dissolved. Um, in, in chemical reactions, we are going to be interested in <coughs> calculating something called a KQ constant, an equilibrium constant. So when we do calculate KQ, it is something that is um, experimentally determined. So um, you'll have the concentrations of the substances given to you in the question, but so um, and so you can mathematically calculate it, but it's really those values were obtained through experimentation. Um, it doesn't have a unit and it's only valid at a specific temperature. Remember the brackets mean um, concentration, in this case molarity. So an equilibrium expression, you can see these are my products. In front of them would be the coefficients of the balanced equation or the number of moles of those. So what you do is you take the molarity and you raise it to the power of the coefficient. So let's say this D had been a 3, then we would have cubed the, the D um, values molarity. So let's practice. Um, so here we go. One other thing that's really important is that we only write the expression, the molarity for things that are aqueous or gases because they can um, change you know, their concentrations. Whereas if it's a pure solid or a pure liquid, um, we don't include those in the expression. 
So when I'm going to write my KQ expression here, it's going to be the products, but this is solid. It doesn't have a molarity because it's a solid, so we would just throw that out. We would also throw out this solid. So we're really only including then any gases or aqueous. So the KQ would be equal 1 over, because there's no products, um, the concentration of the reactants, which the only one remaining is the carbon dioxide, and there's a 1. So it's really to the first power, which you, you can or you don't have to include that power when it's only one. So let's do another one. So here is another. Remember, it's always KQ equals your product. So the right side, and this is a gas, so we'll include this. So it would be the molarity of the HF. And then this is the going to be squared. And then over the molarity of the hydrogen, times the molarity of the fluorine. So those are both to the first power, so you don't necessarily need to include that. Um, yeah, and I don't know why this got, kind of should have been over here more. But anyways, um, so you have to be able to write the expression because eventually we're going to calculate it. So we'll do one more equilibrium expression here. Um, again, it's always the products on the right side, so I'm going to include the HCN going to be to the first power. I'm not going to include the sodium chloride because it's a solid. I'm not going to include this um, sodium cyanide either. Um, and then I would have HCl. So now um, why do we do this? We calculate KQ because it will have a number value. If it's greater than one, that means you have more products than you have reactants. So we sometimes we say the products are favored. Um, if the value is less than one, that must mean that you have more reactant than product. So then that means your reactants are favored. You're going to have more of the reactants than the products. And if it equals one, then you can you would then say that neither the reactants or the products are favored. So here we'll do an example. And this is one we just wrote the expression for. So if you um, already wrote it in your notes, you can just use it again. So HF squared and then the hydrogen times the fluorine. So in this question, they're telling that experimentally, they determined the equilibrium concentration or molarity of the hydrogen. So we know the molarity of the hydrogen is 0.25. Molarity of the fluorine is also 0.25. And these are always have to be molarity. So if they're not, you'd have to calculate them. And then HF is 0.052. So I would just plug in square this and then it would be 0.25 times 0.25. So when you calculate that we get an answer of 0 0.043. So that is less than 1. So that means that I'm going to have a reaction that favors the reactants, which means I'm going to have more reactant than product. I'm going to have both of them in the container of whatever wherever this reaction is happening, but I'll have more um, reactants because it is um, less than one. Let's do another one. Or not. Actually, we're done. I hope that helps you to understand equilibrium. Um, just really that reactions can be reversible when they are, um, once they reach equilibrium where the rate of the forward and the reverse reactions are equal, um, then we can calculate the equilibrium expression. I mean, we can write it first. Then we calculate the value based on the concentrations or molarities of the products and reactants. And then we can think about you know, whether if it's greater than one, our value, then we, we have more products than reactants in the container. Less than one, we have more reactants than products in the container.